This conference will now be recorded. Perfect. Um, so we are recording today. If you happen to miss any part, um, you will get a copy of the recording at the end. Um, the other thing that we are doing, and I've done this for all of these brainstorming sessions, is I have created a Google Doc, and I'm going to share that link in the chat. Um, I will share it a couple times throughout our discussion, and then the link will also be in the follow-up email. Um, my hope here is that because we can't all meet in person for a workshop and sit down in groups like we normally would and sort of brainstorm, <laughs> Um, that we can create a living document for people to come in and share program ideas. And so um, you don't have to run in and start doing this during our discussion. You'll have access to this later. Sorry, you probably hear my coworker in the background there. Um, but it's a chance for us to capture programming ideas. Um, if you're doing grab and go kits, we have a spot for that if people are just needing new ideas. And if you have any external presenters that you wanna share their information because they do such an amazing job, um, this will just be a chance for us to continue to share information even once our brainstorm session is done today. And this can also be shared out to colleagues and um, you know anybody else that you may want to share them with. Um, and I'm gonna turn my camera on so you can see who's talking to you. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Casey Shiley. I am the Youth Services Consultant uh, for the Florida Library Youth Program. And what's really fun for me about this particular brainstorm session is that, you know, I typically work with youth services staff um, throughout the state. And when it comes to summer reading, some of those same, same staff are involved in adult programming. But a lot of you are very new to me, and so I haven't had the honor or the privilege of meeting you yet. So this is really fun for me to sort of be in front of a mostly new group. Um, I'm very hyper, in case you haven't picked up on that already. Um, <laughs> but um, what I really want today to be is a chance for you all to share what you've been doing, what you're planning on doing, any challenges that you've been having. Um, the intention for today is for it not to be like a typical webinar where I'm just giving out information to you all, but it's really yeah. meant for it to be a brainstorming session for you all to share information with one another. Um, Dolly said, not hyper enthusiastic. We will go with that. Um, so I have some questions that I can ask to, to start off the conversation, but what I'd really rather do is open the floor to you all. Um, does anybody have a great just adult summer reading program that you either did last year, you're planning on doing this year, or you've maybe done it as just regular program that you're planning to, to carry forward? Um, I'm going to open up the floor to you all, and then if I end up, you know, listening to crickets for too long, I'll throw out some more questions. Oh, I can go first if you like. Sure. Uh, I'm not okay. <laughs> um, our friends at the library group donated two $25 Home Depot gift cards that we'll use uh, just a simple drawing thing where, you know, person checks out a book and they get, a, you know, a little ticket that they put into a drawing for one of the gift cards. Very cool. That's all I've got so far. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Um, you know, it's interesting because I come from a youth services background, so adult programming, um, it's it's such a different thing. It's you know, it's you're such a different audience, and so I'm always interested to hear, um, you know, how you all are engaging in your adult programming. I'm also going to be doing a uh, more online programming this year, of course. Uh, probably be doing uh, art classes as well as um, cooking demonstrations. Very cool. Jonathan, are you all doing that in-house? Do you have staff who are taking the lead on that or are you bringing in external presenters to do that? Uh, basically just me for that. But um, we also reached out to a local publisher of horror fiction, Central Florida, and uh, they have, I mean, they represent many authors, so we're hoping to do like a weekly book talk with each of them, each of their authors that are interested. Um, we have connections with the SCA as well, so 
that's sort of going to be like all ages in a way. But um, they do a lot of different programming, such as, you know, how to make leather shoes or, uh, you know, sword play and things like that is fun. And of course, our regular STEM programming, which for some reason we have more adult uh, followers of that than, than any, anybody else. <laughs> Um, Nancy Keel from the Blake Library in Stewart, Florida. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of adult programming that I expect will flow over into our summer programming. Um, many take and make kits. We have a local painter that we worked with that creates the kits for pickup. Then she supplies us a YouTube video for people to log on and take virtual instruction. And partnering with other um, local businesses, there's a company called Board and Brush. It's basically um, plywood signs that you see. So they'll supply the kit and the instruction um, and the patrons come and pick those up. Um, we've done that with ceramics and many other art mediums where we have a whole take and make going across that's very successful. Um, virtual yoga has also been another one um, that we've been able to supply that uh, patrons are really enjoying as well. Um, and cultural music um, demonstrations uh, we've partnered with a Japanese museum to do an origami online as well. So just uh, really a wide variety we've been uh, dipping our toes into during this time and certainly have um, realized that there is a huge demand and we're reaching, you know, our existing patrons, but also patrons that uh, we really didn't fit into their schedule, but there certainly was a community need. And I'm curious for the um, for the take and makes where you have external folks who are involved, are they donating those materials, or are you all is that part of your your programming budget that you're spending money on? Yes, no, they aren't donating, so that's part of. We have two thousand dollars for adult programming per branch that's funded um, from our friends of the library, and that's where that money is coming out of. And um, just negotiating and I've learned, um, for example, the board and brush one was kind of expensive, but if I bought 40 kits, I got, we received almost $10 off. So I just planned that for four different programs and had them, you know, prepare that ahead of time. And uh, so we saved some money there. I know money is always one of the first questions whenever anybody brings up a wonderful program idea. <laughs> Um, and Nina put in the chat that they did a plant swap for Earth Day last year and people really liked it, so we're bringing it back. Um, Nina, do you have a mic? Can you unmic and um, share a little bit sort of where you got your materials and how you organized that? Um, I actually was reading online a lot of um, different types of uh, garden clubs do plant swaps and we tried it at the library. I pulled resources from my mother, who's a florist. She has a lot of plants. And we got a group of plants together. And then people would bring in their plants and swap it for other plants. And it created like a really social environment because the gardeners would also stay and kind of socialize a little bit afterwards and swap tales about, you know, different uh, plants they had and how they would grow it and ask each other questions so it was really a, a no budget at all because these are items that we already have growing in our backyards or you know if you have a spider plant you know that they grow so many extra buds and a lot of people would swap different types of plants or seeds too we did seeds as well and we got that from our local um the seeds we actually got a donation of them we have a, uh, a college a community college here that donated some from uh, their plant program that's wonderful and I think any programming that can be done with no budget <laughs> is fantastic I love that plant swap idea and guaranteed we're going to steal it. <laughs> uh, I was just so thinking, I, saw, I was just looking at the seed library yesterday and yep, I was like, yep. that'd be a great, a great accompaniment there. Yep. I just made a note of it. Um, and just, uh, we're, we're actually planning something, um, 
for this summer in conjunction with both the Tales and Tales theme and the Seed Library launch that's going to happen in August. So we do um, two launches a year for our Seed Library and we're in our sixth year of running it now. Um, so our seeds that we launch for folks to grow and plant over the fall and winter, we launch that in August. and. Um, and we're going to be working with our local extension office, UFI FAST, to host a program. Um, it's kind of against animals and then one for animals. So uh, planting landscaping um, that's deer and wildlife resistant, and then also how to plant landscaping that attracts animals. So how to kind of find that balance, put things out there that uh, lends itself to wildlife habitat, um, but then also how to know what to plant in close proximity to your house that's not going to get devastated by critters in the night. And Michelle, you all purchase the seeds to give out, correct? They're not donated? We do, yeah. We have a budget for the seeds every year. Do you know about what that budget looks like? I knew you were going to ask me that. I <laughs> don't, unfortunately. I'm say that might be a Deborah question. Yes. <laughs> and Christy from Newport Ritchie put in the chat that they are trying to do hybrid beanstack and in person programming. Um, we have been doing a bit of outdoor programming since September, and we're looking to possibly utilize some of the local parks and businesses for this summer. Christy, can you share um, sort of what some of those beanstack challenges are that you're doing and how you're using um, using that in case there are people who aren't familiar with, with beanstack or read squared? And if you have a mic, please, please feel free to unmute. Okay, um, can you hear me? Perfect. <laughs> okay, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's the first time I've used the mic on my earbuds, so. Um, so we have um, we're planning on doing some different reading challenges, but we're wanting to actually use the Beanstack um, challenges to get people out in our local community. Um, we do have a lot of parks and walking trails and things like that near us. So um, and then we're on a main street, so we have lots of local businesses and um, we're wanting to try and integrate some stuff with that, both for the kids and the adults. and um we're we're still kind of in that planning stage uh it's primarily led with our by our youth librarian and i've just recently moved into the role of doing some adult programming but um yeah we're just we're just trying to uh kind of mix it so that it's partly having to do with the reading and getting in the library but we're we're also going to be having a renovation so we have to think even further outside the box we can't just do outdoor programming in our courtyard we now have to do outdoor programming off-site, so it's, it's, it's extra challenges. <laughs> opportunities. <laughs> yes, yes, opportunities. <laughs> um, fantastic. Anybody else have some great adult programming ideas that they've been working on? Or have you run into any challenges that you want to pose to the group and see if somebody else has experienced some of those challenges and has a, a miracle cure? Sure. Hi, uh, this is Katie from the Venice Public Library in Sarasota County. Um, I was just wondering how people are tying in for adult programs to the Tales and Tales theme. It seems to be a bit easier for youth services. We had that same conversation in the team brainstorming because they were having very similar challenges and so a lot of them were sort of foregoing the theme. This is uh, Oyuki with the Book Arts Home Public Library. We had um, a couple years ago a very successful program which we're hoping to bring back again but in a virtual um, about how to deal with non-native um, pests. Down here we have tons of iguanas with all um, all the water, I'm sure, like everyone else. So we did bring in someone um, from the Fish and Wildlife who, you know, gave us ideas and suggestions for um, for homeowners, and it was surprisingly one of our most well attended um, programs for adults. So we're hoping to reach out and do that virtually as a, you know, 
tails. <laughs> Uh, one thing we're considering doing at one of our libraries is uh, having a nonprofit called Leash Incorporated uh, come out uh, in conjunction with Animal Services to have an Adopt a Day program. Uh, Leash Incorporated gives out vouchers for uh, getting your uh, pet spayed or neutered for free. Very cool. Yeah, I was thinking of an adopt a pet day too. Something that we could do outside. Um, I don't know, maybe if outside, it depends on the the place. But um, uh, because we we aren't having indoor programming, obviously yet. So um, this is Nina again. Uh, we are looking into getting somebody from our local. Um, historic association to come in as well as we have a lot of uh, residents here that's lived here for a long time and come in and tell stories or tales about the area and then do a little bit of history about those tales and um, that's kind of just kind of like a play on words again but history is kind of a story of of just where we live and we're just kind of playing on that for the tales and tales So I feel like this year's theme is, well, first of all, it's the best theme I've ever heard of. It's my favorite theme. Um, and I also feel like it, it's a lot easier for this particular year to tie in adult programming with the theme. Um, like we're looking also uh, to partner with um, St. Francis Wildlife. They do wildlife rescue and rehabilitation um, uh, we're looking to have them come in and do a program for adults. We've already enlisted them to do an out pellet program for our youth. Um, and I suspect, uh, if, you know, as an adult without children, I suspect folks will show up just to see that, um, even if they don't have kids. But we're looking to do an adult specific version of that. So, you know, we have all kinds of great like animal rescues. Um, we have a community that loves animals and nature. So this year it's easy. I know in the past it's been a little tricky, a little bit trickier to tie in. Yeah, reaching out to local wildlife rehabilitation is a great idea because a lot of times they have an educational piece and they really want the exposure. And Plant City, I'm not sure who's on the line from Plant City, sorry, um, said that uh, they've been doing in-person take and make kits and some displays are popular there, but getting the word out for virtual programming has been the hardest thing. Um, suggestions for advertising beyond the obvious social media and flyers. Um, Hi, this is Kelly from Plant City and we're here, I'm here with Hi. Amanda from Plant City. I do adult and see that as youth. <laughs> <laughs> See, Amanda, I know. Um, yes, I do adult. Yeah, I've been here about a year now for adult. We closed about a week after I started, so. <laughs> so, we've been phasing open to our, sure. our virtual. We're trying to do it in person as well, hopefully at some point, but we're just curious what you all do. Because you are so busy and so popular, we wanted to not take up two of the 75 slots, so we're one today. Um, has anybody going to attempt to do any type of hybrid in-person programming outside or socially distant? Thanks. We're thinking on it. We can have outdoor programming, um, and but we do have to keep it under like a certain number and we do have to socially distance and anything that we do can't um, like no shareable things. So if it's a craft, everybody has their own stuff. Um, uh, we haven't really worked out details yet on doing things outside, but we, we are able to, and we have a pretty big, we luckily have a pretty big, um, area around the, our library where you could do like a grassy area where we could do outside stuff. We just haven't tried it yet. <laughs> and there's a question in the chat. Are you worried about rain? Always. <laughs> We're on an <laughs> island, so um, that is always something to take into consideration too.
in terms of rain dates, um, we're doing a guided nature tour as a part of our NEA Big Read programming this spring. And um, what our staff did is they actually filmed the tour in advance. And then they'll go ahead and show that filming and present live. Um, so it'll be a virtual event, but they'll show the film of walking around and then they'll just do voiceover live, um, which I thought was a creative way to um, get past the rain delay issue. Of course, that's that's not gonna work with hybrid models, only with virtual. That's a cool idea. Kelly again from Plant City. Um, I, I was still wondering about uh, if anyone had any suggestions for advertising uh, virtual programming since people around here seem to be most interested in in person. So what's what we offer in person is what is the hit. But we have some great programs that not a lot of people tend to cling toward for some reason. So just what would you all suggest for, for um, bringing people in for that? And Teresa had put a comment in the chat that they have asked to include information in utility bills. Teresa, did that come to fruition? Or have you just made the ask at this point? I don't know if you have a microphone today. Um, Teresa said it was determined that it wasn't worth it for us because we're in such a small community. That's okay. That's why we have chat. And I know too in, um, this was taking it back to fall, but this came up in one of, um, in one of our brainstorming sessions for fall programming where somebody had mentioned that they had also gotten together with their local radio stations like you know like the really super local one um and that they were you know they would be given you know like free 30 second slots here and there to put something out on the radio um, we are also having an outreach slash marketing brainstorming session next week and so that maybe there will be some great ideas that pop up from that as well um, and that will also be recorded and put up and we'll have a Google Doc and all that stuff. So even if you um, aren't on the list for that or you couldn't make it, um, there might be some information afterward that you can also pick up from there as well. Um, Teresa had asked if anyone considered a writing contest for adults um, and Judy brought up uh, NaNoWriMo. Judy, do you wanna share? I could read it, but I know you have a mic. <laughs> yeah, obviously I've been like, um, yeah, um, I've worked with NaNoWriMo before. Um, they do November, and that's actual the actual novel writing month. But in the summer, they run Camp Nano, um, which is it. It's more of a short story rather than the fifty thousand that you write for November, um, and it's for all ages. And you can just sign up online, but you can promote it in your your library, which is what I've done in before. Um, back pre-COVID, we used to have a setup where we'd have times and they could come in and sit and use our um, computers or our Wi-Fi um, to write, and they'd have a like a somewhat quiet place that they could go, or they could get together and kind of brainstorm together. Um, but COVID, you can't do that. <laughs> Might be able to do it on Zoom. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you all had sort of combined that with any kind of virtual meetup. I haven't done it yet, but I'm that might be something I do this year. Is there anything that you all did? last year because obviously last year when it came to summer reading and any kind of late spring um, 
you know, plans had to change and they had to change quickly and, and we all had to be a little reactive. Whereas this year, we at least know that we're, we're still living in a very different world. Um, so are there things that you did last year that you're doing differently this year just because over the last year you've learned to maybe do it in a better way or a more efficient way or, you know, tips and tricks, lessons learned? Um, one thing that came out of our uh, the summer lunch program last year was the, the sheer need for a, a food pantry in this in this community. So from that, we developed one with in conjunction with the Friends of the Library. And uh, my gracious staff turned over the entire staff room uh, to that effort. So it's it's absolutely full of groceries now. And we get people in every day, you know. And we also get cash donations. We got a, uh, a free uh, Sam's Club card from a small business. They, they just said, you know, I have an account, so here you go. Um, so we can use the cash to go to Sam's Club and get more groceries and other things that people need. So one thing grew out of the other. Well, and that's great too, because you know, those summer reading programs are typically for kids. And so to yes. take something like that, to be able to stretch that and to reach that audience that, that isn't reached through that is fantastic. Yep. I mean, and the word is spreading as as far as like one and two counties away. Um, I even ran into somebody yesterday. I was I was working the COVID immunization site. She lives in Seminole County, but she comes over and visits uh, the the town my library is in. And she said, "I didn't realize we could do this." And she's going to tell other people, you know, who who visit the same town to go like boating uh, to. Uh, consider dropping off some stuff here because we accept anything now. I mean, even clothing because um, there are people in this town who don't have shoes or uh, anyway, you can imagine. <laughs> you hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 We can uh, hear you, Colleen. Hear you. Thank you. Uh, this is Colleen Davis from Eastlake Community Library in Palm Harbor. I wanted to expand upon the fellow that just spoke, who I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but we we too started a food pantry and um, it has been in operation now for a month and unbelievable the amount um, of outpouring we've had from donations as well as people coming to get things. And the one thing I did want to share that we were not aware of is that we had a community member uh, call and speak to me about if it was okay for her to come and get things to take to people that are basically living in the woods and are homeless in a particular area and are and um, of course, I didn't have a problem with that whatsoever. You take what you need. And the point that I wanted to make that I didn't know of was that these food pantries that are popping up right, you know, around all of Florida, I've heard a lot of them. The people that need them don't have transportation to come and get things. And we don't live, uh, our area, uh, in Pinellas County is not on public transportation or bus line or anything. So I wanted to just share that with those that have the food pantry because it was something I didn't know. So of course I encouraged her, please, you know, anyone can take anything they need. And the community has really come together and donated cash as well as donated items uh to put in there and i can tell you the one thing that we are noticing that is we really have to stay on top of is personal products feminine hygiene toilet paper things like that and you know i, I do not know homelessness but i surely appreciate learning the things that we have learned um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, it just put a different spin on it. So this person has basically been delivering foods from our boxes to people that she knows that needs it. And I think that's a wonderful thing. 
Thank you. Actually, we, we experienced something like that uh, right around Hurricane Irma. Uh, I was operating a comfort station uh, in our town and you know we're giving out like cases of bottled water and all kinds all kinds of stuff but then uh these fellows started showing up in these massive pickup trucks saying we got people out there you know who are up to their living rooms and water and uh can we deliver water to them so yeah i mean if if there are volunteers willing to do that i mean we don't ask questions simple as uh we don't absolutely no questions asked i mean it's as long as there's an adult with whoever um, they are they they have access. And Jonathan, you did get a question about which library you're from. Can you just share that information again? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm in the north of Lake County in Florida. Uh, I'm the branch supervisor of Astor and Paisley County Libraries. Oh, this is turning my social work card into mush, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, funny you mention that too. Uh, the Astor Library is going to be uh, rebuilt, a little bit bigger, and it will have a, a satellite office that social services can use uh, to meet clients. Because in the past, and I explained this to administration many, many times, uh, like if I see an issue here in town, I have to call uh, a person 45 minutes away and hope that they can locate. The person who needs help up here so so this will make it a lot better because we'll we'll have a short stop <laughs> yeah that's fantastic especially right now i mean we're living in such a time where you know me mental health has always been an issue but obviously right now it is skyrocketing and as are many other socioeconomic issues and they're not gonna you know they're gonna probably get a little bit worse before they start getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, there so, we've always had people who have been destitute, but I mean, now you have people who are new to being destitute. Yeah. So, destitute, sorry. So. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. And it's so great to, to hear how responsive you all are being out there in the field to the needs of your community, which I don't think is any surprise to anybody who works in the library field of how responsive and um, and on top of community needs that libraries, you know, tend to be. I mean, there there's a lot that you can do for people who are in that position. Uh, you pay attention to uh, the kind of things that they're printing out or faxing, something like that. I mean, if they're faxing, you know, faxing in a form to get on food stamps or EBT or WIC or whatever it is, we don't charge them because we're like, well, you know, why kick somebody when they're already down? You, you might want to consider that. Right. Kelly at Plant City, I was thinking for Mental Health Awareness Month to do like a, like a self-care kit. I've seen some people do that, including like little tea bags and notebooks and things like that. Does, uh, does anyone have suggestions for other things that can be included in that? Um, you can, can you can include uh, a blind date with a book with that, believe it or not. Uh, you wrap up your book and then we've, we've attached things to it. Things like you mentioned the tea bag and things like this. Uh, we've attached all sorts of things to books and various themes over the years. Um, You'd be amazed, you know, somebody will check out a book for Valentine's Day just because, you know, it's got a piece of chocolate attached. I mean, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any ideas for our teammates out in Plant City? Self-care checkout kits? I saw a really cute idea that I'm, we may do as a craft this summer on um, building a Zen garden, yeah. which would be self-care because you're supposed to meditate and do the little Zen gardens. Um, and it involved uh, buying frames and um, I think s uh, little rocks from and, and the sand from Amazon and then they got little aquarium uh, 
like plants, the the plastic ones because they were cheaper. <laughs> I don't remember where it's, it might have been on um, programming library and then I saw it. After we re I was just going to say after we reopened in June um, during the summertime, the first giveaway that I had was a giveaway that I called stress less and uh, it was a herbal tea bag and and a motivational card like you know you can do this and i bought them on amazon and then two hershey's kisses and they were extremely popular and i cannot tell you how many people when we gave it to them welled up and started crying i had no idea that it would go like that, but it really was terrific to see people so happy and smiling. Um, well, I assume they're smiling, they have their mask on, but <laughs> but the tears don't lie. You know, it just people were so touched by it and it was something simple and easy to do and it was not expensive at all. I think it was, I don't know, 20 bucks. I bought a bag of kisses from Sam's the cards on Amazon in the little clear plastic bags um, were from uh, Amazon too. And then I just made up little tabs to, you know, paper clip on the top to seal it. Just did that on Canva Pro. People keep asking when we're going to do it again. So it was popular. A really good partner I can recommend if you're doing self-care or mental health programming with adults is the uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness. So we have our local chapter, um, NAMI Tallahassee, and I'll go ahead and put the link to them in the comments. But they actually, it's built into their organization that they do free outreach, they'll do free programs, um, and they've been awesome to work with. We've done a couple workshops for the community with them so far, and I just, I can't recommend them enough. Yeah, NAMI does good work. Teresa also put um, that they're trying to get permission to circulate adventure kits that would include a hammock and straps, a small tent and camp chairs. Man, I wish my library checked out hammocks. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> We're launching a library of things this year. Um, so I'm gonna write hammock down on the list, the wish list right now. That is a great idea. <laughs> uh, there was a question. Are you worried about sanitizing the hammocks and the tents? So, well, um, and Teresa said, don't forget the hammock straps. So Tallahassee is like, um, I think, was it Newport Ritchie that said that they have a lot of parks and stuff around the area. Tallahassee, if you've never been, is like that as well. And so you can drive through any number of parks and see folks with the hammocks tied to the trees. And, um, you know, in our, in our three weeks throughout the year where it's actually nice enough to be outside because we live in Florida <laughs> and we're landlocked in Florida to boot, so. So I am curious, um, so you said you're launching a library of things, and I know that there are a lot of libraries around the state who, you know, do similar things. So I am curious about how are you all handling um, sanitizing, quarantining, what is that looking like for those who are maybe wanting to step a toe in or, um, you know, obviously sanitizing a hammock would look a little bit differently than, you know, sanitizing a telescope um so we like we currently have some items that fall under the umbrella of library of things and what we do with those is just keep them in a quarantine period um for for a few days and then 
you know, let them go back out for circulation. So they're in a little bit of a holding pattern. Um, if there's anything obviously dirty, of course, we like wipe it down. But in terms of COVID, um, it's just time, just giving it time to sit and for the, the virus to die. Hey, yeah, we Teresa. have several kits. We just rolled out um, a new series of early literacy kits, and we did have to kind of modify them from what we had before because we had a lot of puppets, a lot of like paper stuff. And so um, I think they look better. We added a lot more wood, um, kind of puzzles. So after the quarantine period, we also found this um, cleaner. It's not, you know, for COVID, but it kills like 99% of other bacteria um, that's also green friendly. So, you know, it's we're not putting like Clorox on it so that you know after it comes out of quarantine we the staff will make sure all the pieces are there give it a little spray let it air dry and then um, put it back out we're also going to be um, we have some stem kits available but again we're also going to bulk those up uh, we're also looking to um, do citizen science kits hopefully for April for citizen science month and you know everything earth and green day um, so we're really uh, going gun ho with the whole library of things. So we're going to rename ours to You Can Borrow That, kind of like You Can Pickle That from uh, <laughs> Forlandia. So um, we, during, um, I want to say two months ago, we rolled out a puzzle collection based on donations. So same thing, we just let them quarantine. Um, and it's gotten so popular. We have like over 100. Um, and now we're making them um, for, we started with only like 500 as a minimum, but we started getting in requests for um, for younger kids. So our minimum is really now 100. So, you know, younger families with younger kids can take them. Um, our early literacy bags have the the really young ones for, for little, little bitty ones. So we feel like that kind of covers both. Um, we also do cake pans here. So that one, it's, you know, we've always had to clean them anyway. So after they go through the quarantine, um, our staff takes the time to make sure that they're nice and clean and gives them another washing. Um, so um, yeah, we're, we love our, <laughs> our, you know, things that we can check out. Um, in the future, we might be looking into also uh, investing in like Instapods, Crock-Pots, that types of things that you can, you know, equipment kind of materials. People test them out before they just go by. <laughs> Um, there's also, and I'm, I'm not going to read everything out that's in the chat, but there is some chatter going on about um, some different sanit sanitizing methods. Um, so y'all can either read through that now, or again, we are also going to save the chat so you'll get a copy of the chat as well. Judy did ask if anyone has tried the portable UV sterilizers. It's hard when I can't see the other 40 <laughs> or the other 35 people. Um, are they expensive? I think they can be, but that's probably also relative. But I am not an expert on that. So if anyone has, if anyone's checked it out and has seen the cost. Dumco has them for like 300 bucks for a portable UV sterilizer. And I know there's some on the market that look like little robot people, um, which isn't creepy at all as they move around. Um, there was even one that looks like a small robot child, <laughs> which is, you know, the thing that horror movies are made of. But oh, this thing looks more like a phone. I don't know if you can see it down at the. Do I have it down here? Yes. That's what it looks like. See, that looks a lot less like it's planning on taking over the world. True. <laughs> and they have the chests too that you can put books in, but I don't know if, if I really want to try and invest in that. Uh, for all you Harry Potter fans, we actually have the wand version of that. <laughs> Let's wave it over the item. Blank. Does that work really good, or do you only use it? What kind of items do you use it on? Uh, mostly computer keyboards and 
maybe an individual item if somebody's absolutely desperate to renew it or you know thrust it at us. So we just whip out our wand and go from there. I wasn't too sure how those UV things would work on a book when you could actually have germs on each page. Right, yeah. Well, that's why we, yeah, it's mostly the mice and the keyboards and things like that. Jonathan, how, how much is that wand? It's funny, I knew you were gonna ask that. I know that my coworker purchased one. Hey, Elise. <laughs> She'll be right there. How much did you pay for the UV wand? Know, we wipe our keyboards down with one. wipes and the letters are- uh, Four dollars. On where? Walmart. Good. Oh my God. Yep. Apparently it was only $10 at Walmart. Oh. Yeah. And you can find them too on um, at Ollie's um, Bargain Outlets. They have them there. And I also found them on Amazon. You can get the big, big ones for like $15. And ours is about a 12 incher for about 10. She has a black belt in couponing and <laughs> retail. Yeah, I have radar for clearance. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, is that volunteering to do a webinar for us at a later time? At you know, library on a budget? <laughs> oh, sure. I'm your girl. <laughs> that was always over expensive. Um, Better girl than me. Oh. <laughs> with our keyboards, we ended up buying um the plastic covers from it was like a dental supply place, and those work pretty well. And then they also come with mouse covers. <laughs> Sometimes they get taken off by the patrons, but they're not that expensive either. If you want to know who I bought them from, just ask. I'll, I can find it. That makes sense, being from a dental supply company, when you think of all the floaty bits. <laughs> oh, Genco, uh, Genco has them. Janco, yeah, I've heard of them. They've always got a sale on something like right, that. No, okay, I don't Jan, remember. No, what Janway. 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 J A N W A Y. More expensive. Ah. Which is why I went on a hunt and I found them at, at the dental supply place, and they're a lot cheaper. Janway should be great. In libraries and don't think they'll actually go and look other places. <laughs> And Alyssa said we have a big Leave a Life Value book sterilizer that can sterilize six books at once. Um, and she shared that link in the in the chat. Very cool. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, any other programming ideas that we haven't chatted about or um, somebody's wanting to do, but maybe they are trying to figure out how to sell it? Want some, some brilliant ideas from colleagues across the state? Say, so I used to be a social worker. I'm comfortable with silence. <laughs> During this uh, time that we're in, we have found ourselves partnering with other uh, entities within our community. And by that, I mean, right now I have a, um, I've been told to call it a mannequin, a CPR mannequin. And uh, because this is uh, hands-on CPR, learning CPR this month in February. So what we do is uh, we provide, uh, the gloves and it's hands only. There's no mouth to mouth. And then we wipe it down afterwards. And that was provided from our local fire department. And uh, and it helps them, you know, and obviously people that are coming in, they watch a short 90 minute uh, American Heart Association YouTube, which we just have on uh, a laptop. You just press start and it goes. And that's been really, really successful. People just come in, they see it, and um, can try their hand at it without having to take a long, involved class. Um, 
And then today at two o'clock, we've partnered with a uh, senior theater group that's going to be doing a program called, it's a virtual play called Phony Baloney. And it's a spoof on senior scam prevention. So it, it, it's been kind of fun to see who's reached out to us, you know, for support because we have a presence within our community, as do they, but we're all on different levels. So this has worked well and it's great for stats, that's for sure. That sounds like so much fun. I am curious, have you all noticed because you've gone digital, have you, for the most part, have you noticed a shift in your demographic of who you're reaching and like the age groups that you're reaching? Or is it about the same as in person? It's just gone virtual. It's kind of funny with our children's programming, we're having more adults tuning in than ever before. <laughs> Uh, and commenting as we're doing them. Um, and also the geographical reach. I mean, we have got people now all over the United States. Um, and I, I kind of sort of deliberately sent the links to my family in England. So. <laughs> so. I feel like the, national. <laughs> moving to virtual has been awesome for adult programming. Um, I was just looking at our quarterly stats and we're up by like 180 some percent um, this year from last year for adults. And then it's been great for teens. Um, and there are other factors that play in that too. Like we've just undergone a major reorg and we have a different funding structure and yeah, lots of things going on. Um, but it's been great for 18 and overs and then for children like babies, preschoolers, it's been really devastating trying to get that audience. I'm struggling with adults. We used to have two very um, active Socrates Cafe discussions and both the presenters, because they're um, not tech comfortable or savvy, did not want to continue it. And, you know, um, for that demographic, I mean, these people are mostly like 60, 70, really on the, on the upper end. Um, they were not comfortable and, you know, their participants were not interested. Um, it was really uh, a great venue for them to socialize and, you know, get together and discuss things. So I think not having that, um, it really hurts us because, you know, one group was 80, it was an 80, eight, what, 120 between both buildings, um, of guaranteed attendance a week. So our, our numbers are tanking. Um, and I, I do feel you, Michelle, too, with our babies and our toddlers, there's, you know, it's really painful. <laughs> so we're doing okay with our book clubs for adults, but they're not, um, cause they've kept kind of the same, but, but our bigger programs and lectures, definitely, I think, um, people are at that stage where they want in face, um, interaction, but our city is not going that way. So we're just, I think we're going to keep holding until at least the fall here. I would say for us with the take and make, we've certainly reached more of the um, middle of the age people that are working. And that was a dynamic that we were always stretching to reach. So um, like I said, I see us continuing that component as long as we can, regardless of the global circumstances. Nancy, what have been some of the more popular take and makes that y'all have done? Honestly, all of them. Um, like, we'll open registration at 10 o'clock, and by 10, 11, it's full. So, yeah, like, they're filling up quickly. They're loving um, the art and the all the board and brush. Every single one fills up really quickly. Yeah, so I don't have one that stands out. But really, the art kits that they take and um, either have virtual direction on YouTube or partnering with board and brush, they did a beautiful job of the instructions on print. Um, so it really, we didn't have um, any really backroom work to do with that group, which was beautiful because we all know how, you know, uh, busy we are. Uh, so yeah, they've just uh, really been consuming those in rapid numbers. Great. 
Well, we have three minutes to noon, um, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. This has been amazing. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we are what I think will be exciting to a lot of you who do work um, in adult programming. We are in the process of hiring somebody whose focus will sort of be that adult population. Um, no more details at this point, but um, the great thing is that, um, you know, it'll include the literacy and the stuff that we've been doing in the past, but then expand on that. Um, so that we'll have somebody here at library development that's also sort of focusing on the same population that you all are in the adult realm. So we'll, you know, that person and I, I'm sure we'll be working together very closely, especially when it comes to summer reading stuff. But um, so stay tuned for that. That's exciting. Um, Nancy said partnerships are so key while supporting our communities. I agree. I feel like that's been one of the most common things that I've heard in a lot of these get together meetings is partnerships and support and, um, you know, opportunity is kind of becoming a, a buzzword. Um, but, you know, everybody has done an amazing job. You all will continue to do an amazing job. Um, so I'm excited to see what the next few months holds for everybody. So thank you again. Um, this was recorded. We'll send all the follow up here at some point in the next few days. Um, it was so nice getting to meet so many of you for the first time. Um, so feel free to reach out if you need us. My information will be in that email when I send it. So enjoy the rest of your week and enjoy your weekend.